Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottertune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottertune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Uh, we're super excited today to have Victor Meese. Um, Victor is, uh, is a professor now at Erlang. It's whatever he, he's written there. It's a German school, but he's based in Erlang. Uh, he just moved there uh, a, a few weeks ago. Um, so Victor got his PhD from TU Munich under the, the fabled Thomas Neumann, the most German of all the Germans. Uh, and uh, today he's here to talk about LeanStore, the system he's been building with his students. So uh, as always, if you, if you guys have any questions for Victor as he's giving the talk, please unmute yourself, say who you are and where you're coming from and ask your question and feel free to interrupt him anytime. Uh, that way he's not not talking by himself for 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 an hour okay victor it's uh, and also say too it's 10 30 here it's 10 30 for you in germany so thank you for staying up with us uh the floor is yours go for it thank you for having me um, i'm very happy to be here and actually it's now f um four years ago i also gave a talk at cmu and on, on lead store at that time it was very early in the project right we just had a very early um, prototype and, and it, 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 didn't, it didn't even have that name at that, it didn't have any name at that uh, time. And so um, I'm, I'm happy to be back basically and, and tell you kind of what, what's ha what has happened in the, in the, during that time. Um, and also I'll, I'll tell a couple of things that are kind of between, because I mean, there, ha there now have been a couple of papers on Minsor, but I will tell you a little bit between the papers, some stuff that's not published and that helps you to give you basically a better understanding of, of where, what, would we, what we're aiming at. And then also, maybe I'll also implicitly tell you what, what, what's kind of ahead and where we are in the project. So um, Lean Soil, I'd like to motivate it starting with um, uh, showing this graph from a 2008 uh, Sigmund paper from Stonebreaker. And there they took a, a basically traditional um, storage engine, um, which used a kind of traditional architecture with the buffer manager, B-tree, uh, with standard latching and locking, uh, so like 2PL and like area style uh, logging, right? And, and then they, they, they took that code, right? And they ran TPCC on it. And at that time already you had pretty large um, memory capacities. So what you saw there is that uh, you, um, you, you, you measure kind of this experiment with the working set in, in RAM, and then they kind of profiled where does time go, or in this case, where do the CPU instructions go, right? And then they basically saw that if you execute this new order transaction, um, you spend time kind of all over the place, right? And so how Stonebreaker in his uh, great way um, uh, kind of um, summarized this, there's no single high pole in the tent, which means, and all of these components are very, very inefficient, right? Only like, um, depending on how you count, 7% or even just 2% of the work is actually useful work. The rest is kind of just overhead of this legacy components, which have been designed for a very different world when, when you were waiting for disk all the time, right? So the conclusion kind of was disk-based systems are really hopeless, right? And that led to the emergence of in-memory database systems. And that's what uh, I spent basically my, my, my scientific youth and, and Andy as well, right? I mean, I worked on Hyper and, and, and Andy worked on an H-Store, right? And these systems have radically new architecture. They look very different from, from these traditional systems like, like, like the uh, shore system that you see on the left. And just as a rough number, right, here you see on the left, you, you, you require kind of 1.7 million instructions for one new order transaction. And with, um, with these in-memory systems, it would be less than 100,000, right? So it's, it's more than one order of magnitude, just lower instruction count, and you also have better scalability and so on. So it's, it's, it's a big deal, They're much, much faster. And there's been a tremendous amount of research there, but there is one caveat, I would say, and that was really kind of the starting point for Lean Store is that all these in-memory systems, I would claim they don't really have really good support for large data sets. So they, they basically assume that your data fits into RAM and as long as it does, they work great. And when, when they don't, when the data set doesn't fit into RAM, then it's, 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 it's problematic, right? So there, there's some extensions, but uh, it, it doesn't work that great, right? And so this, this, this was really the starting point for Lean Store, right? And, um, in addition, what what you also saw, and, and this has kind of continued, is that um, even after decades, for decades, you saw that DRAM prices have been um, 
basically decreasing very quickly or the capacities have been increasing as you see in, the, in this plot so there's a logarithmic scale here of the last 20 years right but what's what's really striking here is that around 2012 so a little bit a couple of years after that paper that we just saw uh, was published the uh, DRAM kind of stopped actually um, getting cheaper right or larger conversely right and I think that's really a major, major change, right? If you just look at the slope before 2012 and after 2012, it's, it's very different, right? Um, and, and so that means that, I mean, data sets are just uh, keep on growing, right? So it's not like um, uh, data will always fit into DRAM, right? You, you, want, um, uh, you want to basically process ever larger data sets, right? And, and so what you got, right, is um, another trend, which I think is, is kind of an underappreciated trend because um, it's, it's kind of... Uh, um, I don't know why, but I'm personally very much <laughs> in favor of, or um, I'd like to um, like ad advertise that the importance of flash, right? And as you see in this graph, right, flash has become really, really, really cheap, right? So um, that ten years ago, there were many, very many papers that said, okay, you need flash, and there's an additional cache in front of disk, right? But now actually, flash has become so cheap, you you basically can't get rid of disk, and and. Um, and the nice thing is now Flash is like about 20x times for the same dollar amount um, uh, larger than DRAM, right? And and I think that's basically the world we're in now. We have to uh, use Flash, right? It's not enough to just be about DRAM, right? And to make this more concrete, let's look at kind of the hardware that, that we're um, thinking of when we when we design and test uh, Lean Store. And we, this is a, a server, we have almost this one and we're about to, well, we had one in the old place and new place, we're, we're getting an upgrade basically. And so the, the spec that we'll be getting is what you see here, 64 core CPU, uh, like 500 gigabytes of RAM. And that's the important thing here now, you get 10 uh, of these new PCIe 4 SSDs. Each of these SSD has four gigabyte capacity. So if you have uh, 10, you have 40 tera uh, terabyte, uh, sorry, uh, you have 40 terabyte capacity and each of them has seven gigabytes read bandwidth. So you, in some you get um, 70 gigabytes per second, right? Which I think is absolutely amazing. It's, it's actually getting close to main memory bandwidth, right? And even if you look at random IOs, you, you get 15 million random IOPS per second with four kilobyte random reads, right? And um, interestingly, this number is kind of com um, um, comparable with um, with what AWS S3, since, since we talked about cloud earlier with Andy. And so the entire Amazon S, uh, S3 service, uh, recently they had a press release that in, at peak loads, they have tens of millions of requests per second, right? So this is, you can do almost in one, one server with these super fast SSDs, right? And they're not just fast, they also became really, really cheap. So it's just about two, uh, $200 per terabyte and about 20x cheaper than DRAM, right? And so this is kind of the hardware that we want um, to build the storage engine for, right? Um, so let's talk about LeanStore, right? LeanStore is, is designed for this hardware. And what is LeanStore? Well, it's, it's a high performance storage engine, right? Uh, and right now we're focusing kind of OTP. I mean, in principle, I think many of the techniques and the, or even the implementation is, is not OTP specific. It could be used for any general purpose system, but this is just what we start, uh, start with, right? Um, and we, 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 we say that it's not a database system, it's, it's a storage engine because we don't at the moment have any SQL layer, we don't have query optimization, so on. Uh, we, we basically just have a C++ interface, something, it, it's, it's like something like RocksDB, you, you can manage it. They also have a C++ interface, you can link it to your application and then you can um, execute kind of QVIO style operations like um, 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 get key, um, or, um, put key, and, and range scans, these kind of things, and, and hopefully soon transactions as well. And um, we, we try to be um, um, we try to be very scalable on multi-core CPUs, right? And we're optimized, obviously, as this is why I'm talking, uh, talked so much about Flash for these very fast NVMe Flash arrays, right? Uh, we have, of course, index structure, and I'll talk about that. It's a, it's a B-tree. Uh, we have logging, checkpointing, recovery, and uh, I'll also talk about that. Um, we don't have not yet um, concurrency control that we're working on it, right? But I think if, once we get these things together, it will be already useful. And if it's actually stable, right, then it will be a useful um, a piece of technology, right? If, and, and so that's kind of the, the scope, right? So let's let's talk about really the components that and all uh, that make Lean Store Lean Store and, and that um, implement all these features, right? 
Um, so the first one, and this is really where the project started, right? This was um, then um, it was published in 2018, and it's it's the buffer manager, right? Because as I mentioned, the initial motivation was really saying that it's not enough to keep stuff in in, in RAM. You also need to again, as old school systems support um, uh, stuff on 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 disk or SSD. And so the um, the first design decision was basically to say, okay, if you want to store st stuff on, on flash, you have to have page based storage, right? Which means four kilobyte uh, pages, right? Actually, the original paper was talking about 16 kilobyte pages, uh, but turns out four kilobyte with these uh, newer SSDs is actually um, better in terms of um, read and write amplification. So we switched to four, four kilobyte pages. So in memory, you want you would want it slightly larger, you get slightly better performance with 16 kilobyte pages, but because the out of memory performance so much better with four kilobytes, so we kind of uh, switched or will be switching the default to four kilobyte pages, right? Smaller really doesn't work. It doesn't help you any anymore because the, the flash SSDs really only help um, improve the uh, read and write amplification up to uh, four kilobytes. So that's the first design decision. Everything is stored on these fixed size pages. And second thing is, and, and that's kind of the um, main trick here with the with the buffer manager is we use pointer swizzling. Which means that if you're referencing a page, it can be um, you have an eight byte identifier, and it, that can be either a, a pointer, right, or a page ID, and you use one bit of that reference to um, uh, to say basically if it's a pointer or if it's a page ID. And in this example, right, you see kind of a small tree with a, a, a root reference, and in that root reference, you see it has three uh, children. Two of them are swizzled, so. Um, and one of these P3 is like this is a page ID that this might still be on, on SSD, right? And the nice thing is, of course, you can you now can directly follow these pointers if, if the page is in, in, in memory and it, it's super fast, right? And it's much cheaper than a traditional buffer manager, right? So that's one part. The second part is the um, at some point, of course, you're running out of memory, right? And you need to evict pages, right? And and the, 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 the point of, of, of Lean Source replacement algorithm, which is a bit unusual maybe, is that it's really, really optimized for these hot accesses, right? You want the hot access to do basically nothing, right? No overhead, right? And, and, and we achieve that actually through a combination of kind of two replacement strategies, right? Um, and, and I think um, one way to explain that is through this state diagram, right? So initially, all the pages are on SSD, right? That's the this uh, state at the top, right? All pages are cold, and then you start loading them, right? And then at the same time, when you load them, first time you swizzle them, which means now you can reach them directly through these pointers, right? And then they are hot. And of course, at some point, if you do that after a long time, at some point, maybe your buffer pool will be full, right? And then you have to start thinking about which pages you want to evict, right? And we do this through this artificial extra state, which you call cooling state, right? So what we do is we just um, 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 uh, uh, randomly pick a page, right? And say, okay, you're a candidate for ev eviction, right? And we also, um, when we do that, we unswizzle that page, right? And uh, then it's in this cooling state, right? And then two things can happen, right? Either the page can, uh, is actually a hot page, right? Then it's swizzled back in, right? And then it's back hot again. Or if it's um, if it's actually a page that uh, was a good candidate, right? It can be evicted, then it will be evicted eventually, right? And then so the states, what we do is we, we try to keep a um, certain percentage of pages, let's say 10% in this cooling stage, right? And in this way, you can kind of um, 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 distinguish hot pages from from cool pages, right? And um, the the key to understanding really this this algorithm and why it's the way it is is really this. Uh, first property here that there's no overhead for, for hot pages because if you access a hot page right that is swizzled right you don't do anything right there's not even you don't even set any bit right and so that was the original idea and um, so uh, actually i've come to um, um basically um i suspect actually that we might be looking at the replacement algorithms again right so this was actually a very early idea in, in lisa work and it, it's worked pretty okay right but my, my guess is that in particular, if you look at, and this is what we're doing more and more now, looking at out of memory workloads, you might want to have an even a more, more sophisticated replacement strategy because this one is really optimized for hot accesses, but it doesn't really optimize that much on trying to avoid um, IOs, right? So this, this might be something that we will be looking, on, uh, looking at in, in, in the future. But except for that, I think this design kind of um, 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 has, has worked out so far, right? 
Okay, so that was kind of the original um, um, work, let's say, that started the, the project, right? But then there's, of course, um, other things that you need to do if you want to build a, a storage engine, and not just a, a buffer manager, right? You, of course, you need some kind of data structures where you start, uh, um, store your, your stuff in, and particularly you need index structures, right? And um, so also from the beginning, I mean, it actually changed the implementation. So I'll talk about the current implementation. Um, so, but we always have been using B-trees, right? And the B-tree that we're using um, at, at the moment um, is, is a, I, I call it an almost textbook B plus tree, right? And one important thing here is, of course, it's not an LSM tree. So nowadays, the a lot of um, uh, modern storage engine are LSM trees. Right? So I personally don't believe that's a good idea. Um, so LSM trees might have use cases, but I think it's just not a, by de the default, um, uh, best solution for for most workloads. I mean, that's just my personal bias, uh, and and so that's why we have a, a B plus tree. Um, and um, so um, we support like variable length keys and values, um, and we have a couple of optimizations. I mean, all these optimizations, I actually can find them in the literature. So it's not really um, at least those that are here on the slide. There's nothing uh, fancy or nothing really new here in a way. Um, so one thing that we do is we extract the common prefix from the page, right? So this is what you see in this example below, right? If you have a, a, a B-tree page here that's storing as keys um, URLs, right? And then it's it's not unlikely that a lot of them or all of them on, on that page, all of them actually um, start with this HTTPS prefix, right? So why do you store them um, re repeatedly? You can extract it, right? Um, so that's a pretty well um, known optimization that saves your space and actually also speeds up the key com comparisons. So that, that's pretty cool. And the second optimization that's also, you can also find it in the literature is that um, with these uh, slots that you see in the beginning that, that are pointing to the, the heap-like um, um, tuple values at, at the bottom of the page, right? And there we actually extract the first four bytes into the slot, right? And that, actually makes your uh, binary search faster because before you can, you actually have to have the cache miss at the bottom of the page on the, the heap, basically. You can, you first always can compare the first four bytes, right? And that speeds up the, um, the comparison, right? Oftentimes that's enough, right? Um, and only if those are equal, then you have to uh, fetch the, the rest of the, of the key. So, I mean, this is, um, um, I mean, um, 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 I, I, I've worked on a couple of like very fast, super optimized and very sophisticated in-memory uh, data structures, right? Um, and this is um, in a way, I mean, it's not uh, totally trivial, this data structure, uh, but it's not, not as fast as these, uh, as the very fastest in-memory structures, right? But this is not really a goal, right? And so here you still get the very robust and decent performance, right? So you, you certainly get something like at least 1 million um, like op operations per thread per second, right? And um, it's, as I said, it's very robust. It works for all kinds of uh, data types and so on. And, uh, uh, and it, um, what's also really important, and this is why we need this, uh, uh, this page layout, right? Is that um, you can just directly evict this page to, to disk, right? There's no pointers to somewhere, right? All the pointers are kind of internal. These are actually offsets and not really pointers in this thing, right? So, and every, you can fit it on fixed size pages, right? That's all part of this, um, optimization for um, for these for flash and for fixed size storage right because this is what SSDs want they want fixed size um, pages right and and as I said I mean it's not as fast as the very fast in memory stuff but it's still plenty fast I would say and probably fast enough right? and so that's one one important um, building block right pretty standard now let's go to another part. I mean, I mentioned that uh, with Lean Store, we want to be scale very well on multi-core CPUs, right? And so, um, and in particular, if you now you have to kind of think how you do this synchronization, right? And in, in traditional uh, systems, you or traditional old school um, disk-based system, you just have latches all over the place, right? And they are not just um, and, and the problem is that they basically destroy your scalability, right? Before that, we saw these numbers with the instructions, but these systems are not just have a high instruction overhead, but they also don't scale, right? Because they have uh, latches everywhere, right? And so how do we solve this in Lean Store? Because we still have pages, right? We still end our latching linearity is also on this page uh, um, um, granularity, right? 
Um, so the way we do this is actually, um, and I, I'm actually pretty, um, uh, really happy about this design now, um, because it's relatively simple, right? And it's, it's also very robust because what we do is because we have a hybrid scheme here. So each page has um, two things. It has a version, right? And this is just an atomic 64 bit, bit counter, right? And we'll, we'll see what we do with that. Um, and we have also each page also has a, has a standard OS uh, mutex, right? And now with these two things, I mean, they kind of interact in a, in a particular way. And uh, we have, we can implement three page access modes, right? So we can have an optimistic page access mode, and this one only looks at the version. So it, 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 when it wants to read the page, you can just read the version, see if the page is not latched. If it's not latched, then you just read from the page optimistically. And then after you do, did the read, you check if the version didn't change, right? That's all you do. You never acquired any latches, right? Um, that's, that's the optimistic mode. And then we have also the shared and exclusive modes, and those two work basically um, they just acquire the read write lock in, in the standard way, right? So you can either do this exclusively um, or in the shared mode. And so the um, 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 you have this, this 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 combination of two different approaches. So you have the traditional read write lock, but you also have this optimistic one. And the, this optimistic one is actually turns out to be really really important. Right? And we'll see an example of how how it's used. And another thing that I want to mention, which is actually has been an, one of the great uh, uh, happy moments of my life, <laughs> if I may say so. So, uh, in in the original Lean Store paper, right from from 2018, there's a, a section on memory reclamation, right? Because if you have these optimistic reads, and we had them even in the original paper, um, the one problem that you have is you're never sure kind of um, when you can evict a page, right? Be because you can always have a reader, right? When do you know you have no readers anymore? You, you can never be sure about that, right? And so we had this um, epoch-based reclamation um, um, and, and, and that's usually the, the, the way to, 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 to go about this, to, to, to solve this memory reclamation problem. So basically to find out when you can finally basically evict the page. And, and, and so at some point, actually, this was, um, uh, I don't know, one or two years later, um, uh, Michael Haubenschild, who, who, who did a lot of the Lean Store stuff, he basically re asked this question, do we actually need that, right? I mean, and we, we thought about um, that. At, and at some point, we actually realized that if you're careful in how you, um, if you do two things, if you first never um, give the memory back to the operating system, which we don't do anyway, we're a buffer manager. So if, once we have the memory, we keep it, right? So that's the first thing. And if you make sure that these versions in a buffer frame, even if you put a different page into that uh, frame, if you just always keep the version, always keep increasing, and um, then it just works. You don't need epoch-based memory reclamation and you don't need any memory reclamation at all. So that was a pretty cool thing because it just simplifies the design and it's also more robust. And, and so that, that was a very happy moment, right? Was, it, was this from like a, a, a new PTQ or, or more like veteran? No, that, that was the original um, Michael, who, who was also on the original ICD paper, the, the um, uh, who, who did the implementation. So <laughs> it was really just a realization that after some time we, we realized we implemented some stuff which we actually, if we did a very tiny change in your implementation, we just didn't need it at all. I like that should be an entire PhD. <laughs> you don't need to do that. Yeah, the thing is, this is a, I mean, this is also something I, uh, there's a bias in, in academia, right, for complicated solutions, right? And so you can't write a paper on just saying all the yeah, stuff that you do is, is pointless, yeah. right? Because you, there's, and a similar thing is actually, in my opinion, this optimistic lock coupling idea, which we'll be talking uh, next, right? So you have all these papers talking about uh, very complicated synchronization protocols, right? But turns out in very many cases, you don't need that at all, right? It's, it's very um, sufficient. And this is why, um, why we use this uh, optimistic lock coupling idea, which I'll explain in the next slide. It's also similar like that, right? Uh, it's, it's so simple. You, you basically can, you can't just write one paper about it and, and, and because it's just too simple. But in my opinion, it works beautifully. So if you build an actual system, I'm a very big proponent, proponent, proponent of that idea, right? Um, and so, um, this is actually, we actually didn't invent it. So um, this was actually another student. Um, and at the time, um, we were looking at how we synchronize the adaptive radix tree. And so he, he did a master's thesis with me. And he, 
he came up with all these complicated techniques, right? At the very end, he, we realized, hey, why don't we just um, use these versions and interleave them in a way that we detect conflicts? And then later we actually, and that was also an amazing, happy moment of my life. Unfortunately, in that case, the this technique actually has been published before, right? But even that is an interesting story because uh, these other papers that um, um, published this idea before, they used it as part of very complicated schemes also, right? And so, but nobody had kind of the, um, um, could believe that this such a simple idea is enough basically for synchronization. Right? So that's again, I, I would say this, again, this bias in academia of complicated solutions, right? So that you see that anecdote, right? Okay, but anyway, let me explain what this um, idea that I um, advertised so much um, actually does, right? So. At, at the left, you see here um, actually how normal lock coupling works. And this is the traditional way how you synchronize, uh, let's say, B tree. You can use it for other data structures as well, but let's talk about B tree. So th this, this shows a B tree with four pages and four locks, right? And these brackets kind of show the uh, ordering, ba basically, um, and the interleavings, how you, you latch this thing, right? Or lock it, right? So that's normal lock coupling. Yeah? The problem about this is, is really because normal lock is actually you have to physically write to that cache line and then your scalability is, is totally destroyed, right? So this is not a good idea, right? But the, the thing is we have these versions, remember, we have this optimistic locking mode, right? So what we can do is we can just basically almost one-to-one -one trans, um, translate the same synchronization idea with uh, into the optimistic lock coupling, which looks almost the same. So every lock basically becomes a read version. Uh, so check if, if, if it's not locked and read version. Then you do your, your load, uh, your read optimistic in that page, and then you validate. So that's the optimistic um, read. And as you see, you still have these overlapping brackets, and that's the coupling part. So you can over overlap basically these uh, validations. And in that case, basically, you get very simple and but also very effective synchronization um, uh, approach that that works for for all kinds of data structures. Right? So, which is I'm a very big fan of that. Um, and um, the the important thing about that to realize, I mean, it looks almost the same in the slide. So, what's the difference? The difference is what I said before is that you don't write to shared cache lines, which means that you don't invalidate any other caches, right? Uh, for instance, at the root node, think about the root node, right? If you always latch the root node, even just a very brief moment, you will invalidate all the other caches um, right? that would all otherwise have that uh, root node uh, in, in cache, right? So that that's really um, one of my favorite techniques. Unfortunately, I mean, I, I cannot um, claim to have um, invented it, but we can at least try to uh, get people to appreciate it, right? Okay, so... Um, um, we have this pretty standard B tree, right? We have optimistic lock coupling, which also looks kind of um, 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 like like almost like normal um, uh, um, synchronization of B trees. But there's also a couple of tricks that we can t uh, teach even a, a, a traditional B trees, right? And th this we published in, in uh, this year or presented this year at, at Cider. And I think these are also two pretty cool ideas. So one thing is that in a B tree, because we are not just in a B tree, but because we have page wise storage, right? Um, what can happen is that on a single page, right? We store multiple tuples and multiple, uh, and, um, and, and those might be hot, right? And they just end up to be on the same page, even though they are unrelated tuples, right? And since we latch on a, a per page granularity, right? And then you get kind of unnecessary contention, right? Unnecessary write contention, right? And that's it. Um, I distinguish that from read contention because read contention we don't have because we use optimistic lock coupling because reads don't have to latch at all physically. But with these writes, right, you get these um, unnecessary co contention. Right? And this technique that we presented here is, uh, called contention split. It basically uses probabilistic per page counters to whenever you want to latch a page and you, you don't get the latch because somebody else is holding the latch, right? That's a candidate for contention. Then you record kind of how often that happens in that page and also on uh, which, which tuple was basically, which uh, slot in that B tree did the contention happen, right? And so we have this meta information. It's not shown here in, the, in, in, in this slide, um, but once you, you have that, you can actually decide since we're a B tree, we can decide to split the page, even though there's no other reason to split the page, right? We just uh, split it in order to get rid of the contention, right? But you can do that, right? 
Um, and, and then, as you see in this example, these two hot tuples then may end up at, at different pages, right? And you can do it multiple times. So if you have, a, um, I don't know, um, a one page with lots of extremely update heavy counters, right? Contention split will put each of these, eventually each of these counters on a separate page, right? And then you have reduced the contention, right? As far as possible. Of course, if everybody goes to the same tuple, then uh, there's nothing we can do, at least with, with this approach. But at least you get rid of this right contention that happens from squeezing lots of tuples on the same page. So that's the first technique. But of course, now what can happen <laughs> is that these pages become under full, right? Because we split them all the time. And that's in general kind of a problem with B-trees that they can have low space utilization, right? Because um, this is just how the algorithm works, right? And, and there's also some often the, in, in, um, an advantage that is um, like advertised by LSM trees, they can have higher uh, space utilization because they don't have these under full pages that are maybe only 60% full on average, right? But it turns out you can also um, um, implement something, um, a trick here for, for BGs, which you call the X merge, right? And um, the um, the way we, we integrate it is, is as follows. I mean, you can do it in other ways as well. Uh, but basically the idea is that whenever you want to evict a page, let's say you want to evict the blue page there, right? In, on the left-hand side, right? Instead of directly evicting it, right? You could also check if you, instead of evicting it, because you want to evict it to get a empty free um, space in the buffer pool, right? And instead of evicting it, you could also think about compacting kind of a, a range in the B tree, right? And that's exactly what we're doing. So the X merge would look at kind of a couple of neighboring nodes from the from the blue node from the, our candidate that we want to evict and see if we can merge them, right? And in this case, what you can see is that because we have space for three keys in this toy example uh, per node, we can't just normally, as you did normally in B-tree, just merge two nodes into, into one because it just wouldn't work, right? It wouldn't help us anything. So, which, which is why X merge takes X nodes, right? And merge them into X minus one nodes, right? And in this case, right, we merge three nodes into two, right? And we saved one node, right? And then we don't have to evict anything, right? So we saved some, um, um, uh, some eviction basically, right? So pretty simple idea, right? This could be different ways how you could um, precisely implement that. But I think it's, it's also pretty, pretty um, interesting, uh, tweak basically and um, twist to, to a pretty standard B3 that we have that we have here. Okay, so um, the um, next thing that I want to talk about is um, it's a big topic, right? Um, and I won't go into details, but I want to um, um, mention basically the um, what would we have here is logging checkpoints recovery, right? And the, I mean, at this point, right, you, we kind of, um, started to look like, um, like a traditional system, right? We have fixed size pages, we have B trees. And so how about areas, right? That's the standard uh, way of doing the, these things. Um, so, um, um, and Aries has many nice features, right? So you can have arbitrary live transactions, you have fuzzy checkpoints, so you don't have to like stop the world and uh, do your checkpoint, right? And you have fast index recovery, right? And that's actually very important because we're in out of memory systems, right? So a lot of in memory logging approaches, I mean, there have been many proposals for that, or, or I wouldn't say many, a couple. And what many of them have in common, basically they rebuild the indexes just when you, after recovery, you just uh, first recover your tuple and then just rebuild the indexes from your tuples, right? And that's okay if you assume everything fits into RAM because then that's pretty fast. But in an out of memory system, your index might be larger than main memory, right? And if you on recovery start building like a 10 terabyte index, right? That's not, that's not, not a good recovery time, right? So uh, once we go into this direction of out of optimizing for out of memory, then we also need kind of much of many of the features that, that Arius actually offers, right? But the problem with Arius is that it's, it really doesn't scale multi-core CPUs, right? So because it has this a single global lock, a single global write ahead lock, with a with a latch around it, right? That just won't uh, won't scale, right? At, at these uh, transaction rates that we want to achieve, right? So what do we do, right? And this was the um, a paper that uh, that was published last year, um, and th this again looks kind of as a, a tweaked version of a traditional technique, right? In this case of, of areas, right? So what the same as areas we're using ph physiological write ahead logging with read and undo logging. Physiological means we are logical within a page, but physical 
um, across pages, right? So um, a write ahead log entry tells you page ID 57, right? And then tells you insert key five, right? And we have undo and read information in the write ahead log, right? Um, and um, and then the second thing that's, um, or one thing that is actually different from Ares is that we have uh, not just write one write ahead log, right? Um, but or not just one log partition as it's uh, shown in this picture, but we, we actually have multiple, right? And so, for instance, one per thread, right? One per worker thread. Um, and then in the picture, what you see here, basically, that's the design we kind of argued for in the paper that the best thing you want to uh, have actually is that that each of these log partitions, or at least the, 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 the tail of it, is actually on persistent memory, so on byte addressable persistent memory, because then you can actually implement very low latency commits, right? Because with persistent memory, you can commit in, in, uh, in about a microsecond or something, right? However, there's one small thing, because it's um, one trick that you need to do, and that's also described in the paper, is that um, it's because you, it's not enough to have just multiple write ahead logs. Uh, because they cannot commit independently because you um, you still need kind of this illusion of having a single global lock, right? Because if you have seen something on a page and uh, but the right ahead logging to uh, entry is on a different um, in a different partition, then you might get unrecoverable schedules, right? Um, and so this um, problem that it comes from just having not just a single right ahead lock, but multiple ones. But we show kind of an optimization, which we call um, remote flush avoidance, but that can kind of basically fi fix this issue, right, at, at low overhead. And with that, you can get actually very um, high scalability and very low commit rate uh, uh, commits. With um, Unfortunately, um, this only works if you have persistent memory, right? So if you have SSDs, then the latency of SSDs is so high, then you're back at group commit, right? Then, and, and so we, we now actually also have group commit implementation. and because most systems don't have persistent memory. But conceptually, I think actually this is one of the places where persistent memory is kind of really great, right, for, for these low latency commits, right? And and I think this would be the best design to, to have that um, a very, you don't even need a big amount of persistent memory, you just need it for the tail of the log. And then you can, as you show in, as it's shown in the picture, you can stage it to SSD then, and so that, that all works, right? So that gives us scalability, right? Um, and what the paper also is talking about is that we uh, managed to bound the recovery time, right? Because, um, I, well, my um, um, assumption is basically, or my claim is that you, you don't really need extremely low recovery times. You don't need like recovery in five seconds or something after a crash, because if you boot a new, a new server or something, it, that takes minutes anyway, right? So what you want is kind of bounded recovery time. So you want to know that if you, if you recover, it will take, I don't know, whatever, 15 minutes or something. Uh, and but, but not 15 hours, right? And um, and what you also don't want, and that's also what a lot of um, uh, legacy systems have, they have these extremely in invasive checkpoints. So your system is very, very um, fast, maybe. And then at some point you have these, these spikes in latency or suddenly your system becomes very, very slow because the checkpoint is running, right? And this is also something that you can actually um, solve. And, and we have a actually very simple um, um, approach there described in the paper. Basically, the idea is that you um, uh, interleave the checkpoints with uh, the write ahead log volume. So let's say you, you, you first limit how much write ahead log you write, let's say um, 20 gigabytes, and you say, um, whenever I crash, I want only to um, basically recover 20 gigabytes of write ahead log. Right? And then you couple basically this uh, write ahead log volume with the checkpoints, and that gives you exactly the smooth nature. So you don't have any hiccups anymore, and you bound the recovery time. So it's actually a pretty simple idea, I would say, uh, but it's very effective and it gets rid of these uh, crazy spikes that you have in a lot of systems, right? So we I have that, that, that technique's pretty common. I think MemSeagle does that. Yeah. So. Uh, I, 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 I totally believe that actually, because it's it's so simple, it makes so much sense, right? But yeah. it, it's true. I mean, but actually we haven't found it in, in, in any paper. So maybe it is somewhere. And um, a lot of systems actually don't do that. <laughs> I mean, uh, and it's it's terrible. I don't understand why not everybody's doing that. Um, anyway, so uh, <laughs> there's, there's still some low hanging fruit, I think. Uh, sometimes people are just um, kind of do too complicated things, it seems, right? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so, and 
we have fuzzy checkpointing and the recovery can be um, multi can implemented in a multi-threaded way. Um, so um, we have basically most of the feature set of, of, of areas, right? And all this stuff, I mean, it's not free, right? Implementing this stuff, also just the instruction overhead, it's not for free and the paper um, shows you kind of the breakdown. Um, but I think basically you have to have, uh, you have, it's not as bad as, as like legacy systems because you can actually implement that in a more efficient way if you just um, do better engineering, I guess. Um, and you get all these nice features that you need in an out of memory system, right? So this is what, um, what we've done and, and I don't, um, I don't see many really realistic alternatives if you really optimize for the out of memory case. Um, okay, so th this were, this were, these were actually um, kind of um, all the um, techniques that I wanted to talk about. So what's missing is um, some performance numbers, right? And so I have to add a couple of caveats. So we still don't have con concurrency control. So for reason, uh, in this very first experiment, this is an in-memory experiment, right? And this is just for basically calibrating the, um, the, the in-memory performance in a way. So we, we see a lean store with Silo, and Silo is one of these in-memory systems. They just optimized for, for in-memory performance. And as I said, it's not fair because Silo already has, um, uh, not already, it, they have concurrency control, we don't. Right? So it could be that if we implement concurrency control, then we might be slower than Silo. So the point is not that we're faster than Silo. The point is that we're in the same league, right? Even though we actually have all these out-of-memory features, right? And that's the very point of lean store, right? That's, it shows you that you don't have to be in memory to be fast in memory, right? Um, so that, that's 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 one thing here, right? And by the way, these transaction rates, of course, are totally insane, right? So if anybody knows what what TPCC does, right? This is not um, um, basically your DRAM capacity would be full after thirty minutes at most, right? Or something like that. So in a way, all these. In, super optimized um, um, in-memory system, they're like Formula One cars, right? They are not really something you can really use that much in production. They're really made to write Sigma papers well, because you can get, even, I don't know, 3 million transactions per second, right? I mean, you're generating over a gigabyte per second in the long too. It's, it's quite exactly, long. exactly, yeah. right? I mean, and also you don't, there's no network front end that give you that can give you that many transactions into the system, right? Even, even if each one is a, like single short tr transaction. So it's, yeah, it's not really realistic, I would say, right? So, but uh, it might be more realistic, right? At least if you, if you can support out of memory workloads, right? So, and this is what we see here. So here, what we do is now, um, I, I, we fix the buffer pool to 10 gigabytes, right? And then we dial up basically the data side by, by basically increasing the number of warehouses in DPCC, right? And this is now in a setup with, seven PCIe 3 SSDs. As I mentioned before, the setup that we had before would have about um, uh, um, more than more uh, 2.5 X the bandwidth that we have here, right? So this is already kind of not, not state of the art anymore, but that's what we, what we, what we had so far. And so what you see um, is that you, you quickly fall below this uh, millions transaction per second, but even in a setting where your data size, size is third, more than 30 times larger than your buffer pool, you still get more than 100,000 transactions per second, right? This is the, the green curve here. And you see on the right, in the right plot, what, you, what, what happens with the IO, you see that the, in total, you do more than 10 gigabytes per second of IO, right? Um, and so this is also split here between reads and writes. Um, so you see the reads are kind of in, in, in increasing all the time. So in TPCC, it's kind of interesting because if, as the ratio between the data size and the buffer pool becomes larger, then the ratio of reads to writes also in increase, right? And um, the writes only, it's, let's, um, they're actually not really decreasing per transaction, but it just looks like uh, looks this way because the transaction rate is also decreasing here, right? And so the point is now with this experiment is actually you can uh, manage extremely large um, OTP installations on flash, right? With these very big arrays of NVMe SSDs, right? And you can have, I don't know, the, third, the 20 terabyte um, um, OTP workload there. And I think that's pretty cool, right? I mean, this is, this is by the way, still preliminary work. So we're like trying to, to get this um, uh, even better, right? Um, and one thing that I should mention also, that was also not in the original paper in 2018, it was mentioning that 
oh, IOs are still relatively expensive, right? And at that time we had only a single SSD. They were pretty expensive at that uh, time. And we were saying, okay, it's fine. Whenever you do an IO, you just briefly, not while you do the IO, but briefly you just acquire a big global lock, right? Just to manage the IOs. Turns out if you start adding multiple SSDs, that's of course will become a scalability bottleneck. So we had to get rid of that also, right? So um, I was, um, um, that happened very quickly, right? Once we had more than one SSD, right? And uh, so we, we have, a, you need to do a couple of things to achieve this, right? Because if you look at something like WireTag, which is actually one of the fastest systems, right? And as, as far as I know, right? It's faster than RocksDB, for, for example, in, in this workload. And it's, it's, it's much, much, much slower, right? It's okay. This plot is hard to distinguish from zero. It's not zero, it's, um, but it's more than 10x um, slower, even at, at the very uh, big data sizes here. Okay, so um, um, that was the performance number. So let, let me kind of conclude what, 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 what we've seen here. Um, the, this is again the plot from the beginning, right? And um, if you kind of follow the, the talk, you will realize that a lot of these things that we saw in the plot we actually covered today, right? So we don't need any hand coded optimization because the lean store has been implemented from scratch. Everything is efficient anyway, right? So we talked about logging, we talked about latching, right? We talked about the buffer manager, right? The only thing that we didn't talk about here is concurrency control and so locking. As I said, I mean, that's kind of work in progress, right? So, and so what have, what have we learned here, right? And what is this lean store thing? And I think it's kind of funny because it's in a way it's, um, 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 it looked very old school, I would say, right? This is, I like this uh, analogy to back to the future, right? It's both both futuristic and old school at the same time, right? And so many of the techniques that we're using is conceptually they are really old school database stuff, right? Uh, but it's it's oftentimes with a twist optimized for modern hardware, right? And my, my personal goal is to make it basically as simple as possible, right? So whenever I kind of simplify or manage to find an idea that to simplify something that makes me really, really happy, right? Uh, for instance, with this epoch stuff or this optimistic lock coupling, that make, make, those two things make, make, make me really, really happy. And I think we've made lots of progress, but there's still lots of stuff to do, right? And we'll still, we'll continue working on it. and. I mentioned through, throughout the talk a couple of things that we were, that we're working on. I mean, the concurrency control part. The uh, I mentioned the network front end. I mean, we haven't really done anything that, but that's obviously um, something that needs um, some work and um, uh, the cloud story and many other things. So um, stay tuned, right? And there's a link here the, where you can find all the all the papers here that. And that uh, if you're interested and there's also there's now an awesome the um, open source release um, I should mention it is not in the shape that you can actually use it for anything in production so this is really still um, a research prototype but we're trying to um, make it into something useful at some point right okay that is that's it what I wanted to tell you and I hope um, you have some more questions okay awesome so thank you Victor I will uh, applaud on behalf of everyone else uh, so we'll open up to, to the audience. Uh, if you have any questions for Victor, please unmute yourself and fire away. Hey, Victor, this is Matt, one of Andy's PhD students. Um, I noticed on one of your slides, you were, you were benchmarking some of the Zen 2 stuff, the, the AMD roams. Have you encountered any like interesting artifacts or, or um, from a system design standpoint, you know, when you switch from, from targeting Intel systems to these new AMD systems with their massive caches and, and different interconnects and stuff like that so uh, not really so um the um let me think i mean what one difference is maybe that's what you were referring to is that in the single and uh, non non numa intel boxes they still have a sh um, shared l3 cache and amd does not right which means the something like cache like ping pong is, is a little bit more expensive on, on AMD than on Intel, right? So if you find a fighting on, on one global lock, right? But that's something we're trying to prevent anyway. So, um, so the answer is no, that's been pretty, pretty painless, I would say. So there's not, not a big um, uh, difference there. And I would even go one step further. I mean, we haven't done a, a, a huge amount of work there, but actually um, Adnan, who, who was actually implemented this this version of lean so that you the numbers you're seeing here uh, one of my, my students he, he i actually 
he was actually also benchmarking lean store in on, on one of these uh, AM, um, fancy um, arm boxes in in ec2 this graviton 2 i believe they're called and interestingly there i mean there we didn't do anything right and we never ran an arm before and even that worked beautifully you, you get scalability curves almost um, uh, similar like th these ones right so it seems to me that i don't know um that it, there's actually um uh, all these these CPU architecture are not that different in the end, even if you have a different instruction set, right? At least for the code that, that we, uh, we used here. I was going to say, does that mean you're relying on fewer x86 intrinsics as you as you build up the system and more just on C++, you know, STL doing compare and swaps and, and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. Just I mean, the library handle it? I mean, there's no intrinsics in here at all, I, th I believe. Let me think. Do we use any intrinsics at all? I don't think we use any Zim Zimli or anything, right? Because this is straight C++ code, basically, right? So I think there were a couple of comp compilation issues when, when Adnan um, ported it to ARM, but it was really, I don't know, five minutes of or 10 minutes of work, probably. Uh, there was no, no fancy stuff. Well, thanks. Hi, uh, Victor. This is Lin. Uh, Hi, Lin. Yeah, yeah, nice to see you again. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, it's online, but uh, yeah, nice to see you. Uh, so I have my question is that you mentioned you use this um, non-volatile memory uh, mm -hmm. in part of uh, the in one of the techniques, but just use a small part of the non-volatile memory, right, to uh, shorten the latency a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, what's your take on the <laughs> role of non-volatile memory potentially in being store? Right? Is it possible that at some point non-volatile memory become I don't know, part of the bigger role of the storage mm. stack, or maybe even replace SSD at some point, right? Mm. Mean, you know, Joy did his thesis on the Yeah, now. absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, the, um, my take on, on that is that um, at the current price point, right, it, I see it very difficult for PMEM to take off, basically, right? Because the it's basically as expensive as DRAM, right? And so um, you can always, for the same, or maybe it's a little bit cheaper, right? Maybe two x cheaper, but that's not enough, basically. So, which means that for the same price, you can always also buy buy a DRAM, right? And then you also get very, you get, but, but DRAM has better performance, lower latencies, right? And and so, in, for instance, if I go back to 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 this plot, right? If you were to to plot PMM here, it would you wouldn't be able to distinguish it from DRAM, so. And um, for me, it's really about e economics, right? Once it gets cheaper, then things are radically different. And then I think the lean store design might not make that much sense or might need to be significantly changed, right? So we had that um, Alex van Rehn at TUM, he had um, that paper in 2018 that showed how you can add an, as an extra layer. So um, between flash and DRAM, this PMEM layer, right? And I think that would be something that you need to do, right? But for that to make sense, the, the price needs to go down. Until, until that happened, there's actually, I don't see that many use cases. And for instance, in the cloud, there's still no PMAM, right? I, I, I actually don't see many uh, software products at all that, that use PMAM. Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. The Baker Davis guys are playing with it, but yeah, there's, nobody's shipping it as far as I know. SAP maybe, but because they, they need the very high end um, and just capacities, main memory capacities, uh, as far as I know. There's, uh, there's, a, there's other people, but I can't say here. Mm. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. I have two questions. Um, first question is sort of what do you, what's your third thought about where you want to go with concurrent control of this? Um, the NDPP is, you know, the, that's what everyone choo chooses in this, in this world. Um, and you sort of already have basic version tracking in your, your bus tree with optimistic you know, latch coupling, mm. but you don't actually maintain the versions. Uh, so, so what are your thoughts? Like, how you, like, do you, first of all, do you think you, you're going to support multi versioning? And how do you think you're going to do it? Yeah. So, um, yes. <laughs> so the answer is yes. And, um, the, the challenges to me seem to be um, there. Um, I mean, there, there's many things there, right? If you just say multi version concurrency control, right? And as you know, uh, there's many uh, design decisions. And this is basically exactly what we're, we're doing, right? We're looking at these different um, um, options there, right? I mean, for instance, garbage collection is a big, big, big thing there, right? And, and but also the physical storage, what does it mean um, to have multiple versions of the tuple, right? Do you, I mean, uh, Kakaton and, and Postgres, right? They copy the entire tuple, right? This is 
probably not what we want to use, right? So, so there you, you have the hypers idea, right, of these delta chains or so. Yep. And, and so, but all these things are kind of subtle it, and in, the implementation matters, right? And, and so it's, it's interesting, right? It's also something, um, there's so many papers on MVCC, but if you actually want to build it, um, there's still many decisions that you have to, 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 to make, and it's still not obvious how, how you want to build it. That's, that's our, our state kind of at the moment. And, and we're trying to, to build something that, that actually works and that's robust, right? That's why we did that one paper where we looked at like, yeah. the four design decisions. But those, those, the indexing stuff is the other part too that I think, mm. like, what do you actually store in the indexes? Yeah. Track different versions. That's the that's the tricky one too. Yeah, exactly. Do you do you store them in the indexes, right? That's what you could, you could also store them like in some under yeah. place, right? So exactly. I mean, those exactly those those you could you could get, generate more dimensions, right? And and all yeah. of them you could you could make plausible arguments for for and against them, right? Yeah. And and for instance, also, um, Lean Store is is a, is a, as least conceptually is a steel system. So it means you can evict dirty pages to to uncommitted pages to to SSD, right? Yeah. And you can have arbitrary large transactions, right? And then what what does that have for implications on the commit? And so all the, these questions are what we're thinking about. Yeah. Okay. And then my last question is, and this is if you don't have an answer, it's okay. I mean, you were let's. let's for better or worse, you were the, the the try guy, right? You were the radix tree. You got you're the one that revived it from from the the ash heap of of computer science in some way, for at least for databases. Why did you, why is Lean Store all in the V plus tree? Why didn't you kind you know, of build it off a try? That's also an interesting question. And um, so it turns out I I've um because I'm the try guy, if you want to call me like that, I worked for a long time, and I still have it on, on my on my disk here, a, a, um, a data structure called uh, called Bart, right? So it's uh, basically a hybrid between a B tree and an art, right? So the thing is, if you want to put it on um, on a, if you if you want a, a buffer managed in, in try, you it needs to look a little bit like a B tree, right? So you need fixed size pages, and you encode the, uh, the try into that, right? And the reason why we're not using that in Lean Store is that it's pretty complicated, right? So in Lean Store is called Lean Store and not Compli Store, right? And and so I basically come to the conclusion that it, it would be a little bit faster, maybe it would be even two x faster, but it's just not worth it on on the on the on the grand scale of things. So that that's basically the 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 answer I would say. So it's, it's sometimes not always about uh, absolute peak performance, I would say, because. And you, you can always spend that effort also in other optimizations, right? So you have to kind of be economical. Yes. I mean, it's, it's a very um, a very German way of thinking about building a system. I like it, right? That's why we, I'm not German. That's why we end up with the VW tree. Anyway, so <laughs> with that, Victor, thank you so much for spending your time with us at night. We appreciate you thank for you. this talk. It was super interesting.